Rick Riordan's absolute contempt for the movie adaptation of The Lightning Thief, the first book in his series Percy Jackson and the Olympians, is well-known lore in the fandom. For years, he has made his opinions towards it known. I'm not talking about a few snarky or sarcastic ribbings either. He has consistently referenced the movie on his blog and Twitter, and never in a positive way. Given how much hate and mockery book fans have heaped upon the adaptation, the fact that the author agreed with the sentiment and even took a very active part in the jokes felt like vindication, and disappointment with the movie was practically universal across every member of the fandom. But ever since the Disney Plus series was announced, the attitude towards the films, because there have been two now, has slightly changed. I wouldn't say the fandom has reassessed them, but there's a different flavor to how they're discussed. Jokes are more likely to be about the movies than at their expense, certain moments have become memes in their own right, and of course fans have shared aspects or details about the movies that they actually like. It feels like the vibe has shifted from fans wishing the movies had never been made and dreading any mention of it, very similar to how Atla fans treat its film, to us almost appreciating the camaraderie that bashing the film provided. It went from being the fandom's number one enemy to practically a part of the fandom. If I were to guess, I'd say that the promise of a new, far superior from everything that we could see adaptation produced in part by Rick Riordan gave fans a sense of relief that let them joke about the movies more lightheartedly. They were no longer the one chance fans were going to get to see the stories represented on the big screen. Plus, the show reintroduced the property to the mainstream on a better foot. With this new attitude in mind, a large segment of the fanbase started calling for Easter eggs or references to the movie, like including the Lady Gaga song that was featured in the casino scene somewhere in the show, or having actors from the films make cameos in it. Plenty of people suggested that there were actually genuinely good moments in the movies, and I am obligated to mention that a few people floated the take that the movies actually aren't that bad or are even good. These people were in the minority, but they certainly existed, and the fact that the fandom tolerated these opinions says a lot compared to the fandom's reaction to the films in the years immediately after they came out. Here's the thing, though. I don't think a lot of fans, especially newer fans, realize that Rick is not playing along with this bit. Rick was never playing up his hatred of the films for comedic purposes. He doesn't just think that they're bad movies or disappointing adaptations. He freaking despises them. He hates that they exist. And his attitude hasn't changed. He does not look at the movies with rose-colored glasses. He has not forgiven them. And honestly, why would he? This movie deal was the most exposure that the Percy Jackson books had gotten since they came out. Most regular people of all ages would associate the property with these terribly received films even if they knew of the books. Gods know what happened behind the scenes, maybe they actively made pitching a new adaptation harder, or even put it off of the table for years. Of course he'd feel the resentment towards them. Another thing you might not know though, Rick himself actually hasn't seen the films. He's gone on record saying he never will. So everything that he knows about them has come from secondhand reports, trailers and promos, and the screenplay. Specifically, the working screenplays for the Lightning Thief movie. You see, once upon a time, it seems that Fox, which owned the rights to the books, wanted his input on the adaptation and actively shared details of the filmmaker's decisions and copies of the working scripts with him. And Rick shared his feedback in return. Pretty reasonable and practical feedback, mind you. But clearly his input was ignored or he was outvoted, because we all know how the first film, The Lightning Thief, turned out when it premiered in 2010. So fast forward to 2018. Rick makes a sense-deleted blog post called Memories from My TV Slash Movie Experience. In this post, he shares emails that he had sent to producers of the film in 2009, in which he gave his reactions to the then-still-in-process script. And, well... The script as a whole is terrible. When I first read the script, I'll admit I was plunged into despair at just how bad it was. If I were intentionally trying to sabotage this project, I doubt I could have done a better job than this script it will have fans squirming in their seats and demanding a refund. The movie will become another statistic in a long line of failed movies badly adapted from children's books. I wouldn't see it, I wouldn't let my kids see it, I wouldn't recommend anyone else see it, and I certainly wouldn't want my name associated with it. I hate to compare this to murder, but... <laughs> so, obviously I, as a fan, love this. I eat this up. And not only did I recently graduate from college, but on the day of recording, it's my birthday. And Rick Riordan's birthday because we share a birthday. So as a present to myself, I decided to sit down and read the working screenplay, 
while recording my live reactions. Note, this is, I am 100% sure, not the exact version of the script that Rick was replying to in his emails. I think it might be an earlier version, given that the date is September 2008 and Rick sent his emails in March of 2009. It's possible that he wasn't sent this script until much later, but due to certain details from the emails, I don't think this can possibly be the one that he read when he wrote his response. But I'm guessing this screenplay is a close approximation of what Rick probably read. Before we unpack everything, including the full content of Rick's emails, we should get a rough idea of where the filmmakers were at during this time. So let's take a look at the leaked screenplay. Okay, so here I have the script. The Lightning Thief by Craig Titley. This is the credited screenwriter for the finished film. And then a rewrite by Chris Columbus, who is obviously the director. Now, I want to warn you that I haven't seen the film fully in a couple years, and I don't plan on it. I have already immediately noticed that there are some differences between this and the finished product, so I do think that reading the script will be significantly different from the experience of watching the film, which is why I think it might be valuable. So we can see that it starts in a swimming pool. I do know that the movie starts in a swimming pool. Interior indoor swimming pool night. Wooden bleachers line the surrounding walls of the Olympic-sized pool. The room is empty. Moonlight shines through the skylights, reflecting off the water. Nike's Jay-Z t-shirt and an eye touch are piled at the pool's edge. Wow, it really is taking me back. Camera cranes inside the water. At the pool's bottom, we find Percy Jackson, age 17, sitting with his legs crossed, dressed in cargo shorts. Wait. Okay, so he took off his shirt, but he is wearing cargo shorts in the pool. Okay, this I highlighted because I find it deeply ironic. His long, dirty, blonde hair floats around him. His expression is peaceful. So the- well, I shouldn't say the original. I so the original Percy was black-haired, but in the very first adaptation, they were already wanting to make him blonde. Every single Hollywood producer who touches this book is like, this boy is blonde, what are you talking about, Rick? Percy says, and I, I don't think there was narration in the film, but this one apparently did have some. Ever since I was a kid, I liked being in the water. It's where I do my best thinking. Sometimes when I concentrate, I hear this distant voice, like somebody is trying to guide me, give me direction. Weird, huh? This opening line reminded me immediately of that movie Danny Gonzalez reviewed, that mermaid movie. My whole life, I've dreamt of water. Not just being in it, or swimming in it, but living in it, breathing it, tasting it, loving it. I think that honestly, even though voiceover tends to be overused in a lot of movies these days, these these books can use it, especially I think when you're trying to appeal to a younger audience, I think they kind of connect with a, a narrator, like a main character more if they can hear directly from him. My name is Percy Jackson. I didn't think to tell you this until now. Until a few months ago, I was a student here at Yancey Academy, the kind of place where parents send their troubled kids when no one else will take them. That's pretty straight out of the book. A 52 year, that's very specific. Gray-haired, bearded teacher in a wheelchair, Mr. Bruner, lectures to a group of kids who would rather be elsewhere. Percy stares at his textbook. My so-called troubles had impressive sounding names. I thought when he said his troubles, that he was gonna launch into like the time that he accidentally dumped his entire like sixth grade class into a shark tank at an aquarium, but no, he's just talking about dyslexia. Percy lies awake, the walls around him covered with posters of surfers riding extreme waves. Okay, they're really going hard on him as a surfer. Why, why, did, why do all of these adaptations try to erase the fact that he is a skater boy canonically? Tacked to the wall is a photograph, Percy and his mom in happier times. I was always supposed to have some displaced rage because my father abandoned my mom before I was born, but quite honestly, none of that really mattered. Distant thunder roars. Percy gets up, looks out his window. Storm clouds form in the sky, obscure the moon. Because my real troubles were just beginning. He's supposed to, I guess expected, to be mad at his father for being absent. But he's not because his troubles were just beginning? How does that retroactively make him not mad at his father anymore? This Okay, so they are at the Metropolitan Museum in Manhattan. The sky above Manhattan is heavy with dark, ominous clouds. A Yancey Academy bus is parked in front of the museum. Later. 
a spacious glass-domed room filled with ancient Greek artifacts, rusted weapons, and artwork. In the center of the room are imposing sculptures of the 12 Olympian gods. Mr. Bruner lectures from his wheelchair. There are 12 Olympian gods. The major three were brothers who went on to rule the world. Zeus became the king of the gods and ruled the sky. His brother Poseidon ruled the sea. And their other brother Hades ruled the underworld. I guess because I'm just seeing this all written down and not like delivered dramatically with like intense editing, it just seems like such a plain basic way to tell this very simple information that these kids probably already know. A group of fairly disinterested high school seniors stand around Mr. Bruner. Percy stands off to the side, sweatshirt pulled up sweatshirt pulled up to hide his iPod headphones. I think they should have said hoodie. They said sweatshirt, which made it feel like he's holding his whole sweatshirt up. Grover, Percy's roommate. Okay, not his friend, his roommate. Stands beside him. Grover is overweight with curly brown hair, glasses, and a wispy goatee, and a perpetual expression of lust and mischief. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Okay, I was just gonna say that this version of Grover looks like he has more in common, but like physical description wise with Book Grover. But then he does this. But also, mischief is such an interesting thing to attribute to Grover because Grover's entire purpose, the entire purpose of his character and satyr guides in general, is to keep their demigod out of trouble. So it already sounds like he's gonna suck at his job. Okay, Bruner is as upset about this as we are. Grover, please. Grover looks up guilty. At least he has the shame to feel guilty. A little more respect for the gods. I mean, to be fair, Aphrodite probably would consider this a sign of respect. Grover sighs, hands over the cell phone. Bruner looks at the photos. Okay, don't- okay, okay, now they're just like shaming Grover for his photos. They call him a sex addict, which is, first of all, implies that he's addicted to having sex, which is a weird thing to say about a high schooler, and also probably not correct. What the f- what does this tell us about Grover? Possibly Grover may be a tad more hormonally challenged than most teenagers, but he still shares a similar weakness with all of us. Lust. Now this is gonna be a lecture about like the seven deadly sins. Why is he talking about lust? Oh my god, they're using this as a segue. Oh my god, they're using this as a segue to talk about how the how the gods had kids with humans. I hate to say it, but the movie at least fixed some of this. At least they had the wherewithal to take out some of this. The children of these unions were half god and half human. Can anyone tell me what they were called? Oh! Oh! Nancy is a boy! <laughs> they made Nancy a boy! Mr. Boba Fett, what were they called? Bastards, mongrels, mutts. Okay. Just because it's right doesn't mean you should say it. Drew's two friends, two hoodlums named Tony and Vince laugh. I like that he has, like, backup. This is very of the times. I wonder if there's gonna be a lot of similarities between this and, like, the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies. Because for some reason, this film, maybe it's just the fact that it's New York City and it's a high school and they go on, like, a field trip that then triggers a series of events that results in the main character realizing that they're special. But, like, this, for some reason is giving Spider-Man. So this is like the Flash, basically. Percy doesn't hear, he's lost his- it would be so funny if he was just listening to like ocean sounds. What is the proper name for the offspring of a human and a god? Percy narrows his eyes, thinks, and finally it comes to him. Demigods. Very good, Mr. Jackson. Mr. Boba Fett, you and the rest of the class obviously need a bit more incentive to learn this material. Perhaps a quiz would help tomorrow, chapters 7 and 8. Way to make the all the kids hate Percy. Percy and Grover enter. Grover uses his crutches, walk around with a pronounced limp. The bath- oh my god, okay, there's already a slur that I've noticed. The bathroom door flies open. Drew and his friends enter, shoving past Grover, nearly knocking him over. Percy says, shut your mouth. You're the one who should keep your mouth shut, Jackson. If you weren't so busy kissing Bruner's ass, we wouldn't be having a quiz tomorrow. They accuse him of faking dyslexia and not pretending I mix things up. Like, right now, I could swear your dick is where your head's supposed to be. I don't even understand this joke. It doesn't even make sense. I- okay, I was gonna wait until I finish the scene to say this. But this is so interesting. Digression. So obviously the books are middle grade, which is to say they're intended to appeal to kids between the ages of like 8 and 13. And maybe older kids will like them as well, but that's their target demographic. And that's also like the age appropriateness level that they're aiming for. This was obviously going to be a PG-13 movie all along. Uh, that is the end rating that it got. 
But like this script, even more so than the finished film, feels language and content wise, like so much more like a hard PG-13. The the violence, even though it's fantastical and just some of the dramatic action was going to automatically give it a PG-13, but that would kind of be the only reason. It wasn't going to have like language or sexual content or anything like that. But this script seems to be like, okay, so we're making we're making like a YA movie. Okay, so now they're combining this scene with the Clarice scene at Camp Half-Blood. Drew and his gang drag Percy into a stall and they try to shove his head in a toilet. It's honestly, I feel like it's honestly not a bad choice if you wanted to keep the scene in it, but also keep the bullies from the original. So obviously he makes the water in the toilet explode. All the pipes in the wall explode. All the sinks explode. They fire like missiles. That sounds dangerous. Okay, it forms a shape of several snake-like tentacles. This is, this seems like an extreme manifestation of Percy's power. This feels like something that would come later and also like something that would be very hard for the mist to clean up. The water tentacles whip through the room like living creatures. They attack Drew and his friends. Grover watches in amazement. Percy is baffled. Wow, this, this movie really went from zero to 60 in eight pages. The powerful capital P water lifts Drew into the air. Then Mr. Bruner, oh, you know what I just realized? I hope Mrs. Dodds is in this because they are condensing so much into this one scene. I almost feel, I almost feel like freaking Mrs. Dodds isn't going to be in it, but she must be. She must come back later. Mr. Bruner comes in. He can clearly tell what happened. He gets detention. Okay, there's another reference to how much he loves water. I'm also kind of disappointed that in this version, Percy doesn't seem to care. In the original, Percy didn't want to get kicked out of school. Like, he actually, he felt kind of embarrassed about it, and he really wanted to make everything work, often because he didn't want to let his mother down, which is what Mr. Bruner is now reminding him of. He wants him to read what book? The writing on the cover is in Greek. What book? Hmm. Is it going to be the story of Perseus, perhaps? Rows and rows of towering bookshelves stand along walls, each with their own ladder on wheels. Classic library. He's sitting down. He's going to read the book, A Guide to Greek Myths and Legends. Okay. Okay. So this is just a basic mythology book. Oh. Okay. So we gave him a book that's entirely in Greek. <laughs> presumably entirely in ancient Greek. Lord knows how he got that. And Percy is like reading it perfectly. So I'm expecting from what I remember from the movies that he's reading the ancient Greek and doesn't even notice. He thinks that it's English. Okay, looks up and sees a creature hidden in the shadows leaps through the windows. A creature lands on the floor and slowly rises up. It's over 12 feet tall. The librarian screams. The creature pulls back its arm, sweeps at the librarian with tremendous force. The librarian is knocked off her feet, flies through the air, and slams into the wall, out cold. Percy stands terrified. He starts to back away. The creature turns, faces Percy, and steps forward into the light. It's the Minotaur. This is a wild departure. So I don't think that Mrs. Dodds is showing up. I don't think Mrs. Dodds is showing up at all. I think that they're, they've replaced that with the Minotaur. And then... I'm predicting that he's just going to go straight from here to Camp Half-Blood and is either never going to go home or if so, then his journey from home to camp is going to be 100% uninterrupted unless they then put Mrs. Dodds in there. But why would they do that? Why would they change the order like that? This makes no sense. If the Minotaur does not make sense in a freaking school. Mrs. Dodds made sense in a school because she was disguised as a teacher. Oh my god, the Minotaur talks. Half man, half bull, muscular with a long snout, cruel yellow eyes, and battered razor sharp horns. Seeing Percy the Minotaur roars and speaks in an inhuman voice. Where is it? This feels stupid. The Minotaur isn't supposed to be intelligent. The Minotaur is sent to freaking kill you. Percy rolls out of the way. The Minotaur arms just misses him. So there's a whole library floor. Action sequence, action sequence. Percy tries to run. The Minotaur runs up, swings its razor sharp claws. Are. Are bulls known for having razor sharp claws? He was in for the kill. Then Mr. Bruner comes. He's holding the pen. He says, click it. Then he's, oh, he says the pen is mightier than the sword. Bro. We have no time for your proverbs, uncle. He clicks the pen. It transforms into a large sharp metal sword. The whole sentence is capitalized. He stares at it in disbelief. 
He turns back to Percy, who is on his feet, wielding the heavy sword. Hey, okay, he slices it. There's blood, so there's your PG-13 rating. He swings again. Oh, he slices deep into his torso. Then he just runs away. Okay, that does kind of make me feel like he's going to come back. Actually, he has to come back because Percy's mom has to die somehow or, you know, be taken to the underworld. We have to go. It's coming back for you. Okay, so it is coming back. Coming back? It was her... Why is Percy more alarmed at the fact that this literal monster that he just battled with a sword that came out of a pen in his school library might be coming back despite the fact that it was non-fatally wounded than he was at any other aspect of this situation. Okay, a minotaur can only be killed by severing the horn from its body. First of all, it has two horns. What interesting lore addition. Okay, so Percy is now packing. Bruner is discussing this with Grover, catching him up to the situation. Grover is really stupid. Again, he doesn't understand his job. He doesn't understand that powers and monsters begin to manifest when demigods come of age. It happens when their lives are in danger. His powers have begun to surface. His powers began to surface in the in the bathroom. His life wasn't in danger. What do you hear? Thunder but no lightning? This is a lot of lore to dump to the audience before even explaining it to Percy when we don't even know what's happening yet. Because of who he is, everyone thinks he did it. Oh man, nowhere is safe for him. <laughs> Only one place. Right, you want me to take him there? Grover. Okay, this is a very stupid dialogue. Okay, so they're gonna pick up Sally along the way. I guess Grover's gonna drive. Grover nods, an anguished roar echoes from outside, the cry of the Minotaur. Oh, the Minotaur's back. Okay, this is bad. Uh, oh, they're in a subway train. Grover is silent. Percy's anxious. Wants information? Yeah, I would help so. Quiet, keep your voice down. They could be listening. Who could be listening? Not hearing all these people around. No one can be trusted. Grover stares at an elderly lady who is staring at him. Okay, that could be either the fate, like a fate, or it could be a fury. He lives in Queens. He lives in a working class neighborhood in Queens. This feels... Okay, this could come from either two places. One, it could come from a place of prejudice. Two, it could come from the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies, because Percy was not from Queens in the book. But here we are, a working class neighborhood. They exit the subway, they hurry along the sidewalk over his tense, anxious, suspiciously eyeing anyone who passes. Why did Bruner send you home with me? I'm your protector. You're gonna keep me safe, Percy? I'm asking the same questions. Okay, so Percy offensively implies that Grover can't protect him because he's disabled. Grover is hurt by this, despite the fact that he's not actually disabled. But he's, he's hurt on behalf of disabled people, you know? He is a sex pest, but he's also an ally to the differently abled. They arrive in front of a small, mean, wooden two-story home, sandwiched between rows of similar homes. They walk to the door and enter. Okay, Gabe Ugliano. He's a 39-year-old sloppy, overweight stepfather, sits at a table in this cramped apartment playing cards with four poker buddies. They've brought back the poker. That was not in the film. I keep wanting to say they brought it back, but really they just cut it out in the film. He's drinking beer. Okay, the voiceover has returned. I like that this- Oh my god! Oh my- okay. I have so much to unpack here. Three things. Three things must be said in quick succession. One, this is a weird time for Percy's VO to return. Secondly, for a movie that is so much more, like, adult and intense and aged up, it's interesting that they thought that they would include, like, all of him farting and all of this. Side note of this, it is very funny that he has to explain that they call him Smelly Gabe, like, it's not a particularly creative nickname. Secondly, speaking of aging up the movie and including more intense stuff, they decide to include not only that he is physically abusive to Percy's mom, but also they add in that Percy knew about it. This is terrible. This, first of all, makes Percy look... Okay, I have to be careful about how I say this because I don't mean to imply that like a teenage boy is responsible for saving his mother from a physically abusive husband. Like, he's not an adult, he's a child in this situation. But the fact that Percy doesn't seem to- he seems to treat it with almost nonchalance, that makes him look terrible. In the book, Percy didn't know that Gabe was physically abusive because he didn't do it when Percy was around. And when he found out, he literally almost wanted to kill Gabe. 
And then his mom did kill him. It was treated with some gravity here. It is not treated with gravity in this. Not by the script, nor by Percy himself. Then we get Sally. She's in her mid-30s. She's attractive. She's... That's not necessary. Beaten down by a hard life. There's a toughness, an inner strength, a radiant glow about her. My mom, on the other hand, is an angel. I could never understand what she was doing with that jerk. But Percy, you know at this point that he is physically abusive. It makes this argument a lot worse. <laughs> Both the movie and this script cut out Montauk. They cut out Grover showing up to the beach house on Montauk. So it kind of makes sense that um that came from the script that Grover just shows up at the apartment. Sally is being uh, interrogated as to why she's in an abusive relationship. Okay, so Grover is explaining to Percy's mom that they have to go to camp. They take the car. They're driving presumably to Long Island. Percy turns to Sally. He's upset, worried for the first time. Mom, I don't know what's going on, but I didn't steal anything. Again, with the incorrect details to focus on. I swear, I believe you, honey. I know that you're scared and confused right now. Trust me, I didn't want any of this for you. I thought you could have an ordinary life. But nothing about you could ever be ordinary. That's such a weird sentence to say warm and lovingly. So where are we going? Think of it as a camp. It, it is a camp. A camp for special people like you and your father. Great, a camp full of losers. I thought, given the time that they were going to say the R slur, your father was not a loser. He was a great man. A great man who abandoned his family. He did not abandon us, Percy. He had to leave. He couldn't live in our world. Who, our world, who was my dad, E.T.? Percy, you know all the myths about Greek gods and goddesses? Well, they're not really myths. The gods are alive. They're here. What? You saw the Minotaur. Right, okay. But if the gods are real, wouldn't they be in Greece? I can't tell if that was supposed to be a joke or not. If I were him, I would be like, I saw something, I think I hallucinated it, but it could possibly be real. Now you're telling me that literal gods exist and one of them is my father. Instead of it being Chiron, Percy's mom is now the one delivering all this exposition about the gods traveling, following the heart of Western civilization and being in America. I was young when I met, just out of school working at a resort for the summer, right on the ocean. Your father was not like any guy I ever met, he was just dazzling. For so much love, and then he came along, but he had to leave, so he did abandon us. He had no choice. The gods, by their very nature, can't live among mortals. They are responsible for an entire universe. Then maybe they shouldn't have kids. <laughs> Your father loved you, Percy. Leaving you was probably the most difficult thing he ever did. What was his name? Um, but then they are attacked by the Minotaur. Oh my god, they're, f they're literally throwing cows into the air. This is just like in, I think, the book and the film. They're like struggling to get out of the car. Then Percy realizes that Grover is a satyr. Grover runs slash gallops towards the pine forest. They follow. They're almost to the border with camp. There is an archway, just like in the film. Grover grabs Percy, pulls him through the open wooden gate, but Sally stops the entrance. She doesn't go through. The Minotaur crashes through a row of pines, moving fast, less than 50 yards away. Percy reaches out, grabs his mother's arm, tries to pull her through the camp entrance. An invisible force field wall prevents Sally from entering. I can't go through. I'm not like you. The Minotaur stomps away. He stomps forward only a few feet away. The beast grabs Sally, pulls her away. And I'm guessing he's going to kill her. Yep. He closes his fist around her neck and she melts into light um, and then disappears. He is filled with newfound strength, a rush of burning energy. He charges towards the beast. And then I'm guessing this is just going to be another fight sequence. He stabs the creature, plunging the horn into the middle of his chest. And then he faints. And we're going to get Annabeth. Okay. Okay, next scene. He's in the infirmary. We got Annabeth. Place your bets. Will Annabeth be blonde in this version? Percy is lying in a hospital bed. Annabeth, a 17-year-old girl with stunning gray eyes and curly blonde hair. Just like in the book, except for her age. Okay, so Percy wakes up. He is immediately taken by her beauty. He immediately starts trying to riz her up. She's like, you drool when you sleep. Um, oh, then Grover shows up. He's been unconscious for three days. <laughs> That's a really long time for him to be passed out, considering I don't think he was actually hurt. I don't think he was actually hurt. I think he just passed out of, like, exhaustion and grief. 
Okay, yeah, no, he was, he was thrown violently. Okay, he probably hit his head. Do you remember anything, Grover asks. Just some crazy dream, my mom was there, there was a minotaur, and then you were some kind of weird hybrid goat thing, but then he realizes that all of it was real. I'm sorry, Percy, it's my fault. I blew it as much as be. Yeah, you really did fail, Grover. Percy stares at the horn, his expression is sad, full of despair. Oh, I really hope they find a, a great young actor to embody all of these complex emotions. My mom, she's really gone. Okay, he's dressed and he's depressed. You know, Percy, when you're depressed, sometimes getting dressed is half the battle. And then we get a shot of Camp Half-Blood. It's beautiful, lush, surrounded by a pine forest, the buildings, architecture straight out of ancient Greece. Constructed of stone and marble with weathered, well-worn facades, a small coliseum is visible in the distance. They walk through the camp. Hundreds of kids aged 11 to 21, dressed in modern clothing, are everywhere. They walk past several kids sitting in a small outdoor amphitheater as an older, blind poet recites Homer's Odyssey. Well, yeah, that's going to be popular with the 11-year-olds. Grover. Grover. Don't. Don't. No. Oh my god. Percy. Why you didn't know the names of the three main gods, but you remember that Athena was a virgin? This, these are questions that the audience is not going to ask. Also, the explanation that they do give is extremely funny. <laughs> Just read this sentence and think about the implications for both her and Grover. Goddess of- oh my- Just again- just because it's true doesn't mean you have to say it in your kids' movies. Oh, so he doesn't even get claimed. They already know who his father is. Little weird that they knew the whole time that he was a son of Poseidon and they just let him chill in downtown Manhattan or upstate New York. Why didn't my mom ever tell me? She couldn't. It was for your own safety. There hasn't been a demigod born of the Big Three in over 100 years. Correctly deduces that the Big Three are Zeus, Hades, and Poseidon. That makes you special, powerful, a threat. So then he kind of explains that he is suspected to have stolen the lightning bolt. The ancient law forbids gods to cross into each other's realms. Only a demigod is- No, this is stupid. I don't think that it's true that an ancient law forbids gods to cross into each other's realms. I just I get annoyed when they make dumb changes that do nothing except are wrong. They do nothing except be inaccurate. <laughs> There's gonna be war if you don't remember. Percy doesn't grasp the severity of the situation. And then Chiron's plan is that they'll just stay here until Zeus calms down, because that's that's what happens. When someone takes something that belongs to you, uh, you're really angry, and then more time passes and it's still not returned to you, and then you calm down and you let it go. Then they're gonna convince him that he's innocent. This is a very dumb thing to do. I mean, on the one hand, it's both more reasonable than going on this fetch quest, but it's only more reasonable if you presume that the gods, and specifically Zeus, are reasonable, which they are not. Okay, so then the next day, Percy is sleeping underwater. He wants to start training at 6 a.m. Dang. Okay, so we're getting Luke. Oh! This is the same thing as the movie now I'm remembering. Percy and Annabeth are on different sides, and the Ares cabin don't count as characters in the movie, so that's why they don't get to be read. Percy keeps trying to riz Annabeth. She doesn't care. Again, I feel like Annabeth would be interested in this weird kid who showed up and is a child of Poseidon and apparently killed a minotaur, but she's like weirdly distant and doubtful of him. Luke is small. This is interesting. Luke is a small, energetic, impish kid, uh, which is definitely more accurate to most children of Hermes, but is not accurate to the version of him in the book. But I do prefer it to the version of him in the movie. So let's see. Uh, oh, he's a prankster. Just buzzed in your balls, couldn't resist it. Mild man, god of the pranksters. It's in the blood. You know, again, this version of Luke is at least more interesting than the version from the movies. Yeah, they, they are just playing capture the flag at 6 a.m. in the morning. They haven't even had breakfast yet. You defeated the Minotaur, but I had that cool flickabick sword. What? That would give you an unfair advantage over the red team. Having a sword? They're fighting, swords, I guess swords are allowed. Okay, Annabeth hacks her way through dozens of blue soldiers, several of the blue team run off. She was a, oh my gosh, she's using everything except a dagger. She's 
personally pissed at Percy Jackson. She's trying to find Percy. Oh, oh my god! There's a... Oh, okay. I mean, this is not an important character. I was gonna say, if they also replaced Clarice with another boy, I was gonna say. Okay, so this is similar to the movie. Percy arrives at the flag. He's going to take it, but Annabeth is there. They, they, these are very similar lines to what I remember from the movie, and they are pretty cringy. This is so- I just- I don't know why they always insist on having, like, an antagonistic relationship between, like, the newbie male main character just being introduced to a situation and, like, the established strong female character who will eventually become the love interest. I feel like this is a trope that happens a lot. They always have to start off this way with her being, like, mad at him for not knowing everything right off the bat. Or she's, like, doubtful of him. It's like, in the book, Annabeth had some qualms, but for the most part, she was, like, helpful, and she introduced Percy to the camp and kind of took him under her wing. She did use him to her advantage during Capture of the Flag by basically using him as living bait. She now wants to fight him one-on-one, uh, -on -one, again with a sword, even though she does not use a freaking sword. I also think that there's something weird about this trope because putting the the two main characters against each other then encourages the audience to root for the man to like demolish the woman in battle even though the entire purpose of introducing a female character who is physically intimidating and skilled in combat would be to subvert the trope that women are weaker in combat. Okay, Annabeth is kicking his ass. Chiron is watching and they're like, let's let this play out. Annabeth is starting to sympathize though. She says to surrender. He's like, no way. Annabeth is almost looking remorseful. So that's kind of nice. She at least feels bad about just beating him up for no reason other than the fact that he's new. Percy's bloody battered body lies a few feet from the river's edge. He hears his father. Again, having it be a literal manifestation in his head, like a voice, I feel like is a bit too literal. Okay, Percy crawls towards the water, and obviously we know what's going to happen. The water is going to give him strength. It's going to heal him. And then a trident forms. Again, I have to ask, what was the purpose of them explaining who Percy's dad was beforehand? Okay, Percy is sassing. Persassy is back. Persassy has returned. Or should I say he was preserved in adaptation. And Annabeth is impressed. Annabeth, Annabeth likes Persassy. Luke cannot believe what he just witnessed, even though, again, this should not be surprising. They knew he was the son of Poseidon already. Also, did they win or something? This is so weird. Everyone's just standing around watching the two of them fight one-on-one, -on -one, ignoring the rest of the game. And then when he fights her, everyone acts like that means that they won? So I'm going to start moving through the screenplay a lot faster now because from here on out, there's not as many big adaptational changes as there is in like the first act or like, you know, the opening of the story. And also just for the sake of time, because I've recorded for over an hour now just on the first like quarter of the script. Later that night, they have a bonfire. Aphrodite girl one. I love a man who can handle a sword. I do not like how this screenwriter writes teenage girls. They're at least laying the groundwork for the Poseidon and Athena rivalry. Without that backstory, Annabeth and Percy, specifically Annabeth being so like mean or suspicious of Percy, doesn't make as much sense and just kind of makes her look terrible. She smiles, raises her glass, drinks. Percy does the same. Their eyes are locked, a spark of romance. She suddenly freezes, spots something off screen. In the distance, Annabeth sees three pairs of glowing red dots. Annabeth. No, that can't be possible. Percy, what? He turns. The red eyes are getting closer and closer. Annabeth screams, warning the others. Annabeth, hellhounds! So the hellhounds arrive at camp, and I had to double check whether or not this is in the books because I literally was 100% sure that it was not. And it turns out that there was one hellhound that does attack Percy in the book, but it literally is immediately killed and it lasts like two paragraphs, which is how I forgot about it. But it was basically just foreshadowing that Luke is obviously evil because he was the one who invited the hellhound into camp to kill Percy, basically. But here the hellhound speaks and it asks Percy where the bolt is. No! Two times? Again? 
the same shit twice. And he also says, uh, if you want your mother back, bring Hades the bolt. No, she's still alive, abducted by Hades. Bring him the lightning bolt in exchange for your mother. They're really spelling out the conflict right here. I don't like that the hellhound talks. It's a big dog. Percy stands, walks to Chiron, looks at him, very solemn. Percy. Chiron, the hellhound, it spoke to me, told me that, swallows back emotion, my mom is alive. The hellhound said that I can get her back in return for the bolt. Chiron, but you don't have the bolt. Percy, I know. But you said I could convince Zeus that I'm not the thief. Can't I do the same with Hades? When he realizes I don't have the bolt, he'll give me back my mother. Chiron, it isn't that simple. Percy, why not? Chiron, Zeus and Hades are very different. Zeus can be stubborn, but he is honorable, fair. Hades is a master of darkness and deceit, the personification of evil. When he finds out that you aren't the lightning thief, he'll kill both you and your mother. This is slander. There's just not a single thing that he said about Hades is true here. I feel like you can tell how salty Rick is about people characterizing Hades this way because he just went out of his way to make him the exact opposite in the Disney Plus show. Like, I don't necessarily like that version either, but the version that Chiron is describing is just incorrect to both mythology and the Percy Jackson books and is more boring because he's just like a cardboard villain. Percy asks what he can do. And Chiron says, stay with our original plan. Tomorrow we go to Olympus. Once you've convinced Zeus of your innocence, we will do everything in our power to bring your mother back, I swear. I do like that <laughs> this screenplay is so much more diplomatically focused. It's like, guys, if we all just talk this through, things will work out. But given that these are gods, the language that they speak is quests. They don't want to hear a bunch of excuses from mortals. They don't really want to hear from mortals to begin with. But Percy basically agrees to what Chiron is saying, only to later that night sneak out secretly to try to go get his mom back. Uh, he's intercepted by Grover and Annabeth, who uh, very astutely observe that Percy just plans to walk all the way to Hades, fight him, and get his mom back. It sounds like a dumb plan. But that is what their plan is going to end up being anyways. Interior Hermes house, Luke's room, later night. It is filled with fun house novelties, trick mirrors, clowns, a fortune teller machine, etc. It's so hokey. Percy Grover and Annabeth sit across from Luke. Luke, what makes you think I would know something like that? Annabeth, your dad's the messenger of the gods. He's one of the few who can get in and out of the underworld. Surely he's told you something. My dad's a prick and I've never even met him. I was, I was gonna say, Annabeth, you should know a little bit better than that. Luke, but I have broken into my father's house on several occasions. Luke climbs a ladder to grab so to grab a shoebox from the top shelf. He tosses the shoebox to Percy, who opens it. Inside is a pair of winged sneakers. They're very cool. Uh, he gives them flying shoes. He gives them a map to the underworld. This will lead you to the locations of the three green pearls. This is a copy of a map that belongs to Hades' wife, Persephone. She keeps the green pearls hidden for her many lovers to use when Hades is away. They provide a quick escape from the underworld. You can use them to get out. When is Hades away and Persephone is there? Does Hades go on like out of town business trips very often? This is important. So the way the pearls work is you put a drop of your blood on them, shatter them, close your eyes, and then imagine where you want to go. He gives them a bronze shield and they go on their way. So the first stop on the uh, quest for pearls is Auntie M's Garden Emporium where they obviously meet Medusa. This entire scene is so similar to the movie. It doesn't seem like they changed all that much, so I'm not gonna focus too much on it. But Medusa does call Athena a bitch. Percy, add this to your playlist. Percy swings the sword. Whack. Medusa's head goes flying. It hits the windshield of the truck and falls to the ground. Percy, one down, two to go. Grover drives. I guess that's the benefit to aging your, your characters up to 17 is that they can just steal cars and drive across the country at this point. What's the next location? On the map, the second address appears. Centennial Park, Nashville, Tennessee. Exterior Motel 6 Night. Somewhere on the I-70 West, heading towards Missouri. The motel is located next to an interstate exit. The vacancy light is on, the pickup truck pulls into the parking lot. Oh my god, this part. Okay. <laughs> Interior Motel 6 room night. Percy opens the door. They enter the small, musty old room. There is one queen bed. Grover's pockets are packed with countless vending machine snacks. Annabeth, only one bed. <laughs> oh my god. Grover, I'll sleep in the chair. He plops down in the chair, clicks on the TV, and starts eating a Snickers bar, wrapper and all. 
Grover goes to the adult movie pay channels and makes a selection. How are they going to portray that on screen? Annabeth grabs the remote and turns off the TV. Percy, pretty big bed. Maybe we could both. She throws a pillow at him. Floor or bathtub, your call. Oh my god, you don't need to write fanfiction when the fanfiction is in the movie. Exterior Motel 6, pool night. Percy swims the length of the pool underwater, purging his emotions. When he surfaces, Annabeth is standing there. Nice work today, saving us from Medusa. Thanks. Friends? Percy reaches up and pulls Annabeth into the pool. Percy, mess with the son of Poseidon, you're gonna get wet. Annabeth splashes frantically like she's drowning. Can't swim. Percy panics, reaches for her, then she leaps up and shoves his head under the water. When he surfaces, she's laughing. Mess with the daughter of Athena, you're gonna get outsmarted every time. Okay, I do kind of like this because it is very Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet. So why do our parents hate each other? They both wanted to be patron god of Athens. The people chose Athena. Poseidon was insulted. He cursed the city so, they would so that they would never have enough water. Our parents hated each other ever since. That's the historical version. I think there was another reason your father got so angry at my mom. Why's that? Annabeth, he had a huge crush on her and she blew him off. <sighs> Percy, how do you know it wasn't the other way around? Annabeth, you haven't met my mom. She's a baddie. What's she like? Intense. Always busy. The rare time we spend together, she criticizes everything I do, points out all my weaknesses. She says it's to make me stronger and wiser, but it only pisses me off. So that's the reason you came, rebelling against mommy. You want her to notice you, see how tough you are. Annabeth, maybe, a little, but I have other reasons too. They look deep into each other's eyes, intense attraction. Percy, like what? They slowly lean into each other, lips getting closer. Annabeth, like... Their kiss is interrupted by a flashlight beam shining on them. What's going on here? We're just talking. No funny business in the pool. Get out. My lord. So the next morning, the manager watches the news and realizes that Percy is wanted for the possible kidnapping and murder and stuff. So he points a gun at him, but they get away and they get back on the road. Exterior Nashville, Centennial Park Day. The pickup truck pulls up. Percy, Grover, and Annabeth step out. The Parthenon, an exact duplicate of the ancient Greek architecture, directly in the middle of a modern Nashville park. Interior, it's filled with tourists. They look up at the 41-foot statue of the goddess Athena. It's as if they've stepped back in time 4,000 years. Annabeth, slightly moved, looks at the statue. Percy notices the name Athena on the base of the statue, turns to Annabeth. Your mom, Percy says. Annabeth nods. Percy, does she really look like that? Annabeth, slight resemblance. Grover, nice rack. Annabeth, excuse me? Grover, nothing. Hormones, sorry. I'm just like realizing that he said hormones. Grover's weird lusting over everything makes, especially like girls Percy's age, makes the knowledge that he's actually 27 years old much, uh, feel much different. In fact, I would go so far as to say they probably cut it out on purpose. Okay, so they notice the pearl, but it's like at the top of the statue, so obviously Percy has to fly up with his shoes, so they decide to sneak in after it's closed to do that. So Percy swings around in the sky for a little bit until he eventually gets the pearl, uh, but then he gets caught by the security guard. Security guard, get off the statue. Percy looks down. The security guard stands below the statue. He holds a gun pointed at Percy. There, there's a lot more guns in this version of the story than I remember. The security guard turns. Grover and Annabeth stand a few feet away. Annabeth is holding a bow and arrow pointed at the security guard who chuckles. Security guard, you think an arrow is going to stop me? Annabeth, I'm an Olympian. Is that supposed to mean anything to him, Annabeth? Uh, security guard, I know who you are, daughter of Athena. Yeah, and he's like, Athenian children are not known for their skills with bow and arrows. If you said you were a daughter of Apollo, then I'd be scared. The security guard turns to Percy. I've been expecting you, Percy Jackson. You know me? Just give me the lightning bolt and I'll let you go. Percy, I don't have it. Security guard, I really hope to avoid this. Security guard takes a deep breath, then exhales. His outer skin explodes, showering the room with countless fragments. All that remains of the security guard is a thick, swirling puff of smoke on the floor. Percy, Annabeth, and Grover slowly walk to the smoke. At this point, you can just run. Just start running. You already have the pearl. Get a head start. More smoke clears. Two eyes appear, followed by three, four, six, seven... 
Percy, Annabeth, and Grover step back. Fourteen eyes are revealed on seven different heads. The heads are reptilian, vicious, snarling. They fully form into the giant dragon-like body of the seven-headed Hydra. So then they fight the Hydra. Percy obviously makes it worse by chopping off their heads, but then they eventually defeat it by using um, Grover holds up the head of Medusa and the Hydra turns to stone. They turn, look back at the now stone Hydra. It fits in quite nicely with the Parthenon's architecture. I think it is funny that like there's now just an extra statue in the Parthenon that appeared overnight and the mortals will have no idea how it got there. But yeah, this scene is very similar to how it is in the movie and completely non-existent in the book. There is no Hydra in the book. So they step outside. This time they are caught by the actual police holding presumably actual guns, but then a black Humvee barrels through the crowd, smashes through police cars, and skids to a stop in front of the kids. The license plate reads Warmongerer. The cops fire their guns, the driver rolls down his window, think Bruce Willis. He is dressed in leather, adorned with military medals from various eras. His face is angular, hard, with a strong jaw, his head is shaved. He wears a soul patch. This is Ares, god of war. He lowers aviator sunglasses and grins at Percy. Ares, your ride's here. Yeah, so Ares was in a version of this script once upon a time. He was obviously not in the finished film. Interior Chuck's Diner, day. Oh, I guess it's day now. I guess that took all night. Ares struts down the restaurant aisle. Percy, Annabeth, and Grover follow behind him. He walks by each booth. His mere presence evokes calamity and tension. As Ares pass, babies cry, people start to argue. Ares sits in a booth at the back of the place. The kids join him. With sudden tension in the air, the kids are fidgety, uncomfortable. The waitress delivers the menus. Thank you, ma'am. No menus. Four cheeseburgers, rare. Annabeth, I'm a vegetarian. Four cheeseburgers, rare. No, Annabeth, you're not a vegetarian. Grover is a vegetarian because he's a goat, and goats are all vegetarian. Annabeth, why are you really here, Ares? Ares, Chiron sent me. Ares, are you taking orders from Chiron? Like, I assume this is a lie, but... Are, are we supposed to believe that you would take orders from Chiron to just drop everything and go on a fetch quest slash babysit these random demigods? Ares says he's going to bring them to Olympus. Percy's like, we'll get there. We got time. Ares, he's like, we got plenty of time. Which they kind of do. If all they need to do is show up at Olympus and convince Zeus that they don't have the bolt by demonstrating that they don't have the bolt. Ares is like, he checked the weather recently. Every day gets worse. That means Zeus and Poseidon are gearing up for battle. Summer solstice is only 10 days from now. And if the bolt isn't returned to Zeus by then, it's war. Percy, I'm getting my mom first. Kind of selfish, kid. Putting your personal feelings over the fate of civilization. Percy, once Zeus finds out I'm not the lightning thief, word will spread fast. Then Hades will kill my mother. Ares. True. Unfortunately, you don't have much choice in the matter. You're my prisoner now. He beats up the waitress. Ares, so if you aren't the lightning thief, who is? Grover, if Hades possesses the ball and the son of Poseidon, he has all the power and leverage he needs to take over Olympus. I bet he's using Percy's mom to lure him into a trap. Ares, Hades isn't that bright. Ares, you aren't that bright. The characterization of the gods in this is entirely based on who needs to deliver what exposition when. <laughs> this is so weird. It's like they're trickling out information, but not based on when they would meet someone who would have that information. It's just fully based on them slowly coming to certain conclusions. I almost feel like finding the lightning bolt isn't even part of their quest. Percy's entire goal here is basically just to convince everyone that he didn't steal it. He's not interested in finding it. The book was way more interesting because they were very upfront with the fact that the gods don't really care about innocence. They just want things done. So the number one way Percy can convince people that he didn't steal the lightning bolt is really just to return the lightning bolt from the person who actually stole it. So Ares is like, whoever stole the bolt clearly wants to start a war. And they're obviously like, well, that sounds like you. Oh, because I'm the god of war, I took it wrong. My business is all down here on earth. And if you haven't noticed, it's booming right now. Annabeth then who else would steal it? Ares, someone real clever, a master strategist. Like Athena. You think my mom is the thief? Mother, daughter, all the same. Maybe the real question is, why are you here? Grover is Percy's protector, but why did you come along? To keep an eye on these two? To get rid of all the loose ends? There's no reason for Athena to be the lightning thief. This is the worst, like, red herring possible. Just because she's smart enough to do it doesn't mean that she's going to. Uh, so then they leave. <laughs> Exterior, Chuck's Diner, moments later, night. 
Ares pushes the kids into the back of the van. Percy stops, desperate, looks at Ares. Ares, please let me go. I gotta try and save my mom. It's my last chance. Ares, sorry kid, can't do it. I like that they're being kidnapped by Ares, but all he's really doing is just like telling them to come with him. Presumably if they did try to get away, he would physically stop them, but there's not even the threat of that at this point. Like he just pushes them into the car and then Percy is like staring out the window, depressed and dejected. Like, guess there's nothing I could possibly do at this point. The stakes just feel so weirdly low. Ares drives, Percy is slumped forward near tears, all of his hope gone. Annabeth gets an idea, leans forward to Ares. Ares, what? Did you ever stop and think about a war between the gods? It would be spectacular, the ultimate battle. Yeah? Haven't you been waiting years for something like this? Centuries. Exactly. And look at us. Have you ever seen three such pathetic losers? Do we really look like we can defeat Hades? I'm betting that we get killed on our little suicide mission. I'm betting we never even make it to Olympus, that Zeus never gets his ball. And you know what that means? Ares, war. But if you take us to Olympus, well, there won't be a war. Only Ares, peace. His eyes glaze over. Over. Ares' eyes glaze over, over. <laughs> Ares called Hades stupid, implying that Ares is smarter. But this is the dumbest thing that I've ever seen. Ares was manipulated by just being reminded of the facts of the situation. He would have thought to himself, I do kind of want a war between the gods. Maybe I'll just not interfere and say that I did. But apparently it never occurred to him until uh, Annabeth raised it. But that's basically what he decides to do. He just lets them go and says, I'll tell Chiron I couldn't find you. Percy and Annabeth almost kiss again. Uh, then Grover says, okay, which way to the next pearl? Percy opens the map. The third location glows. Las Vegas, Nevada, Lotus Land Casino. So they then jump on a moving train uh, that's heading west to get to Las Vegas, and the train ends up being filled with farm animals. So I guess this is here in place of the truck that was in the book that was filled with zoo animals that they took to Vegas. Interior train car later at night. A small fire burns in the middle of the boxcar. Grover, Percy, and Annabeth are seated around it. The animals surround them. Is it safe to start a fire in the middle of a boxcar? Is there proper ventilation? Annabeth knows what he's thinking. Don't look at me like that. Grover, like what? Annabeth, like that. Grover, you're being paranoid. Annabeth, I know what you're thinking. Grover, no, maybe. Okay, cross my mind for a second. Knowing Grover, I'm worried as to what he might be thinking about. Percy, what are you two talking about? Annabeth, angry. Grover thinks my mom is the lightning thief. Grover, no, not totally. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. She does hate Percy's dad, and with a little help from you, she could cause Poseidon great pain by hurting his son. I wouldn't do anything to hurt Percy. You almost killed him back at camp. Well, that was not- she wasn't actually gonna kill him, it was training. But Annabeth doesn't say that, she said that was before. Yeah, I was going to kill him before. And Grover says, before what? And Annabeth is presumably saying, before I got a crush on him. But she's too filled with emotion to even say that. Uh, Percy and Annabeth storm off to the top of the boxcar. Oh my god. Oh my god. Grover is somehow worse. Grover somehow gets worse. Interior boxcar, later at night. Grover, alone with the animals, tries to sleep on a pile of straw, covering himself with a burlap sack. A goat saunters up, licks his face. Grover mumbles to himself. Percy's up there, probably hooking up with a beautiful girl, and I'm down here, looks at the goat, with you. The goat continues to lick Grover's face. Grover smiles, warming up to the goat's affection. Grover giggles. Stop it. He looks at the goat, ponders. You know, in this light, at just the right angle, you're sorta cute. The goat kicks Grover in the head and walks away. God, I hope it kills him. Grover sits, Grover sits up, angry, insulted. What? It's perfectly natural for me to have feelings for you. Well, points to lower half. Half of me. Stop it! So this next part is insane. Uh, the train, like, stops. They've reached the end of the line and they all get off. But they figure the roads are unsafe because uh, Percy and now since the Parthenon, Grover and Annabeth presumably are all like recognizable and the police are searching for them. So they're just in the middle of a desert at this point. And according to the map, they're, they're far. They're like far from Las Vegas. But they just decide to set off into the desert and walk the rest of the way. They're just going to set off on foot. 
they're just gonna walk the rest of the way to Vegas. And then there's like a montage of them walking across the desert. Like it's the Bagman episode of Better Call Saul. And this lasts for multiple days. And they run out of water. And they're definitely gonna die. And it's like, wow, I wonder if you got yourself into this scenarios. Who could have ever foreseen this? So in this bafflingly, ridiculously contrived scenario, the screenwriter is like, how do we get our heroes out of this situation? It's not like I can go back and rewrite the sequence to make it make sense because there's no other possible way to get them through this desert. And then the only option that he could think of was a literal deus ex machina in which Poseidon sends three horses to carry them the rest of the way through the desert. Unless he orchestrated this literally on purpose because he just really wanted a scene of the heroes riding horses through the desert. Okay, so they take the horses all the way to Vegas. They finally arrive. Apparently three teenagers riding horses down the middle of the Las Vegas Strip. Nobody saw and recognized them. But if they walked along a road or hitchhiked once, they could be caught. Okay, interior Lotus Land night. Unlike any casino we've ever seen, the place is filled with kids and teenagers, no parents or adults save for employees. There's something odd about the kids. They are dressed in clothes and hairstyles from every decade, spanning the 50s through the 90s. Yeah, that's every decade. Percy, where would you hide a green pearl? An eager, too friendly bellhop rushes up to them. Welcome to the Lotus Land. Hope you've had a pleasant journey. Here's your room key. Percy, we're not staying, just passing through. It's complimentary. Room 400, 4001, take the elevator to the top. So they're offered lotus flowers and they all eat one. Percy, Annabeth, and Grover enter a palatial suite. It has three separate bedrooms, a bar stocked with candy, soda, and chips, a huge plasma TV, sunken lounge area filled with pillows and beanbag chairs, and a huge indoor swimming pool. The kids are impressed. They immediately start checking out the pad. Annabeth opens a closet in one of the rooms. It's filled with the latest designer dresses and shoes. A young girl's dream. Wow, he understands young girls so well. Percy is standing in front of another closet. It's filled with a variety of clothes, all his size. Let's go out tonight. Have some fun. Percy, wish we could, but we're on a time-sensitive mission, remember? Annabeth, we are? What mission? Percy pauses, has to think about it. He can't recall. Good question. I can't remember. Grover, why are we here? I don't know. To have fun? Right. Have fun. That's it. Okay. So let's have some fun. Okay, so then they go out to the dance club, and it's like a disco. There's like a 70s dance classic playing. Uh, Percy is wearing a suit. I do love the idea that this screenwriter thinks that when teenagers would go out to party, or like they would go out to a dance club, they would be wearing suits, and Grover is wearing, like, tails. Percy and Annabeth look into each other's eyes, very much in love. They kiss. Annabeth, let's stay here forever. Percy, why not? They look up and see Grover in the middle of the dance floor. He is surrounded by kids watching his manic, wildly energetic dance. The girls love him. During his dance, Grover rips off his pants, exposing his goat lower half, Grover would. Uh, he finishes with some show-stopping breakdance moves. So there is a montage of them all at the casino. At one point, Percy and Annabeth pass a 70s kid at a vintage pinball machine. Percy accidentally bumps the kid. 70s kid. Hey, you just cost me the high score. Percy, sorry, my bad. You're what? Percy examines the kid who is wearing striped bell bottoms, a pristine Star Wars t-shirt, and a bushy 70s fro. How long have you been here? 70s kid. Couple weeks. Groovy place. Groovy? What year is it? The 70s kid pauses, has to think for a moment. 1977. Percy is stunned, worried. He rubs his temples, hearing a deep voice inside his head. Percy, wake up. Focus, focus. Well, how convenient that he's hearing Poseidon's voice telling him to wake up after he's already noticed that something was wrong. The voice continues to tell him that he needs to leave. Percy continues to realize that something isn't right, completely independently of the voice in his head. But then just at that moment, he notices the green pearl. Just like in the final movie, the employees seem to know him specifically and take special note of the fact that he is awake because they were trying to trap him. I don't like this. I feel like the whole point of the Land of the Lotus Eaters is that like no one is really keeping you there, but the whole place is organized in such a way that you won't leave yourself. That's why it was so creative that it was compared to a casino because obviously a casino uses all of those same tactics to try to keep you there for as long as possible. Percy grabs Grover and Annabeth. He convinces them all to get out of here, they realize where they are, and then they steal a car. Oh wait, I forgot. There's also this part. 
Okay, tell me if this sounds strange to you. Percy, Grover, and Annabeth race across the floor. Lotus Eaters swarm after them. Percy removes his pen, clicks it. It becomes the sword. Percy starts hacking his way through the Lotus Eaters. A young man in 50s clothes is hit with a sword. He suddenly ages, turning into a withered old man before dropping to the floor. So, uh, is it just me, or is Percy just, like, murdering people right now? If anything, you would think the employees there are, like, the monsters, but everyone else there is just a fellow victim. But Percy is just killing them all indiscriminately. He's hacking them up with his sword. It's kind of brutal. So they do escape in the convertible. June 20th, that means tomorrow is the summer solstice. Annabeth, actually midnight, tonight. Grover, so how do we get to Hades? Percy opens the map, revealing the glowing location of Hades. It reads, Los Angeles. Beside it, a sketch of the Hollywood sign. The radio plays. Scientists are baffled by what now appears to be a single storm cloud that has expanded to cover the entire United States. That does sound baffling. In other news, one kidnapper and suspected terrorist, 17-year-old Percy Jackson, is still at large. You know, I think by the time Percy actually does hit the age of 17 in the books, he is at that point guilty of kidnapping and terrorism. Percy pauses, something deep inside is troubling him, an expression of doubt and weakness covers his face. Look guys, maybe it's time. Time to stop. Annabeth, what? Ares was right, maybe I am being selfish. I mean, we've got less than 12 hours to stop the war, we should go straight to Olympus. Annabeth, what about your mom? Percy defeated. We've done everything we can. <laughs> uh, under what definition of the word have you done everything? <laughs> Annabeth. I didn't come all this way to quit. We can do this, Percy. We can save your mom and still stop the war, but you can't stop believing in yourself. You've come too far. Get those weak human thoughts out of your head and start acting like a demigod. Percy nods. He'll go forward. Percy has so little conviction in this. He didn't even hit a bump in the road. He just found out that, like, what he thought was going to happen, which is Zeus and Poseidon preparing for war, is happening, and he's like, you know, maybe we should give up. Maybe there is no hope. Maybe I should just let my mom stay in the underworld. We've done everything we can. And then like Annabeth is immediately like, that's a dumb thought. And Percy's like, okay, you're right. I'll give it, I'll give it one more try. Exterior Hollywood sign later day. Percy and the kids get out of the car, run up the stairs towards the Hollywood sign. Percy checks his map, looks up. Percy's POV. What is this? Son of Neptune chapter one? The Hollywood sign, the words begin to rearrange themselves. The E wood section of the sign fades away. The O morphs into an E. Weed? Oh no, hell. <laughs> they find the entrance. The graffiti says, Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. Okay, and, and what is the purpose of the Dante reference? And what it, why? Why does the entrance to literal the literal Greek underworld, the mythological place, have a reference to 13th century Italian poetry, Christian Italian poetry. They just touch it and then it allows them to enter, transports them into a cramped dark room carved into the grassy, muddy earth. Grover pulls out a pack of matches, lights one, this illuminates the three kids and the face of Virgil. Virgil? Okay, speaking of Dante references, a Roman poet who was not alive in the time of ancient Greece, who was then written about by a Catholic Italian medieval era poet in a Christian text. The writer doesn't know the difference between mythology and like Christianity. <laughs> But Virgil is here for some reason, so they do the same thing that they would have done to Charon, which is they give him some uh, gold drachmas, and then he lets them into hell. I'm calling it hell because Lord knows it isn't the underworld if he's here. They turn now, overlooking the underworld, the dark alternative universe of Los Angeles. The expansive view of Hollywood has changed dramatically, a post-apocalyptic vision of the sunny green landscape. Virgil agrees to escort them through the underworld and walk them all the way to Hades' palace, so that's kind of nice of him. Interior Hades Mansion Hallway Day. Percy, Annabeth, and Grover enter. They are in a gigantic hallway flanked by a twisting staircase. A loud, booming voice echoes through the hallway. Hades, who dares enter my home? Virgil. It's Virgil, and I bring visitors. Hades, who? Percy. Percy Jackson, son of Poseidon. Hades, pause, calm. Nephew, I've been expecting you. Everyone's been expecting Percy in this book. Virgil leads the kids into another room towards the sound of Hades' voice. Interior Hades Dining Room Day. We are now inside of Hades' elaborate decaying sitting slash dining room. Too large to- okay, if Persephone is in this, 
we know for a fact that the screenwriter doesn't know anything about Greek mythology because it is summer. She should not be there. Two large tattered leather chairs face an enormous stone fireplace. A roaring fire is inside. From here, we see the shapes of writhing, screaming bodies. Their muffled screams are heard. Sitting in one chair, watching the screaming souls, is Persephone, Hades' wife. Okay, well, there's that. Hades is in the other chair. He is pale, rail thin, with long dark hair, dressed like a rocker in leather, skull rings, and boots. Russell Brand meets Keith Richards. Yeah, that's what I think of when I think of Lord of the Underworld. Percy, Annabeth, and Grover enter, led by Virgil. Persephone glances up first, sees the kids. She focuses on Grover. The satyr notices her, is immediately attracted to her. Grover smiles, raises an eyebrow. They exchange a seductive look. Grover is a creep, but also, I think, a minor. So they're both creeps here. This is so weird. And you know what? So is the screenwriter. He's officially a creep. I'm, I'm lumping him in here. I don't know who wrote this part. I don't know if it was Craig or if it was Chris Columbus, but they're all guilty. They're all guilty in my mind. Virgil clears his throat. Well, it appears that my services are no longer needed. Good luck, Mr. Jackson. Enjoy your stay. Uh, Virgil practically stumbles over himself running out of the room. You are brave to come here, nephew. I can see the disgust in your eyes. Disgust for my world, for what I have become. But this was not my choice. I was banished here by Zeus and your father, and they have succeeded in making my life, irony not lost, a living hell. Points to food. Do you know what it's like to be me? Every feeling has been taken away. I feel no joy. I feel no pain. I am hungry, but I cannot taste. I am tired, but I cannot sleep. I am in love, but I can never fulfill my desire. Whatever that means. Uh, pretty sure none of this is true. Pretty sure Hades is a god, like any of the other ones. Uh, and I think he kind of likes his job. I never got the sense that Hades doesn't like being in the underworld. The only pleasure in my life is human suffering. When others feel pain, when others experience hurt and tragedy, I feel total and complete joy. Well, then you should be feeling total and complete joy 24-7. I am damned to this existence, and my only choice of- my only chance of getting out of here is by defeating my brothers and taking control of Olympus, but I need the bolt. Wait, so Hades is, like, planning to destroy them? He is planning on starting a war? This is just irrelevant. Give me the bolt and you will see her again. I'm not the lightning thief. I don't have the bolt. I never did. Do you take me for a fool? Percy holds up his shield and sword for protection. Give it to me or say goodbye to your mother. Hades turns, grabs the human bone globe. <laughs> the human bone globe from its pedestal and throws it on the ground directly in front of Percy. The globe explodes and there, frozen in a shower of gold, just as she was when the Minotaur was about to kill her, is Percy's mom, unconscious. The shower of light dissipates. Percy's mom wakes, sits up, sees her son. Percy? Thought I lost you forever. <laughs> Sally's like, what the f- where, where am I? What is going on? Hades sees something off screen that catches his attention. Percy's shield. It lies face down. The handle appears to be glowing, surging with light. And he picks it up, and it is Zeus's master bolt. To Percy, you lied. That wasn't my shield. Annabeth, Luke gave it to him. We were set up. Grover, Luke was the lightning thief. Hades, now I can become king of the gods. He turns to Persephone, take their weapons, feed them to Kronos. Okay, interesting. Okay, so Persephone escorts them all to, like, an enormous cellar. Annabeth, I never would have suspected Luke. But why did he hide the bolt in his shield? Why did he give it to me? Add that to the long list of things I'll never know. Like the feeling of a naked woman, or the sweet smell of- I appreciate him being cut off before I have to read whatever the next word was going to be. He should have been cut off every single time he opens his mouth. I don't want to hear a single word out of him. There is a loud grinding sound. In the middle of the stone floor, bricks separate. The floor begins to slide open, revealing a deep pit. Inside, there is a whirlpool of fire. From deep in the pit, within the flames, something stirs. It roars, then screams. A giant, demon-like face made entirely of flames appears in the whirlpool. <laughs> what is that? Percy says. Grover, Kronos, father of the gods, technically your grandfather. You, my friend, are the proud member of a very dysfunctional family. Think your old man was a deadbeat dad? At least he didn't eat his kids. Only a few feet of floor remain. Grover and Sally clutch the walls for dear life. Annabeth wraps her arms around Percy, holds him tight, whispers in his ear, a sonnet from ancient Greece. He is more than a hero. He is a god in my eyes. The floor continues to open, inches away from everyone falling to their deaths. Annabeth quotes a sonnet from Sappho, and I feel like whoever put this in here doesn't know the context of the original sonnet. 
Anyway, this is basically uh, the ending of Toy Story 3, but just like the ending of Toy Story 3, there is then a random deus ex machina because Persephone has come to rescue them. Percy, why did you save us? Persephone. Hades has been cruel and abusive, forcing me into a loveless marriage. Like your mother, I was abducted by Hades. I agreed to be his wife only if he would allow me to return to the surface for three months each year. It's all that I have to look forward to. A war of the gods will destroy everything I hold dear in the mortal world. <sighs> it makes no sense for Persephone to only be allowed on Earth three months out of the year, let alone for those three months to be presumably summer, because it's summer tonight. It's the summer solstice. So maybe we give the screenplay the benefit of the doubt that this isn't a plot hole. She's gonna be on Earth from the beginning of summer to the end. Those are the three months. But not spring when she is the goddess of spring. The whole point of Persephone being in the underworld is that when she's underground, nothing grows. For it to be she's under- she's in the underworld for nine months out of the year? Like she ate nine pomegranate seeds? The pomegranate seeds are not mentioned. They have been written out of the story. Demeter has been written out of the story. The concept of spring has been written out of the story. Why even bother injecting Persephone into your story when she wasn't in the original if you're going to change so much about her from the original myth that she basically shares nothing in common? So they get the pearls, and remember, the pearls have to have your blood on them, and then you crush them and you think about where you're gonna go, and then it takes you there. But obviously, they only have three pearls, and there are four of them, so they have to make a choice. Uh, but Percy's like, I'll make the choice. He grabs Grover's dagger and, like, stabs his mom. He cuts her finger, puts blood on it, and then that's that. That's enough, I guess. Uh, then he, he does the same thing to Annabeth with a few more steps. Um, and then he's gonna do the same thing to Grover, but he is distracted, which allows Grover to sink his teeth into Percy's arm. So all three pearls now have blood on them. <laughs> And just in time, they all smash the pearls and begin to escape. Grover, it was an honor protecting you. Get the bolt to Olympus. You're our only hope. Percy, I will. And then we'll get you out of here, I promise. Grover exchanges a lustful smile with Persephone. Take your time. Oh my god. Grover, Hades is five feet from you at this point. I would be a little bit more careful about this. Percy, we need to concentrate. Focus on where we're going. A beat. To Olympus. So they arrive in New York City, right in front of the Empire State Building, which is obviously where Olympus is located. Um, and they have 17 minutes until the deadline passes. So they're about to enter, but then they are cut off by Luke. He hovers several feet above them wearing his own very cool, very sleeked wing shoes. Percy, why did you steal Zeus's bolt to start a war between Poseidon and Zeus? Why did you hide it in your shield and give it to me? When I discovered that you were going to the underworld, I realized if Hades got his hand on the bolt, there would be a three-way war. Dude, you kind of should have guessed this on your own at this point. This entire exchange with Luke is like so stupid and lacks any kind of passion or energy because nobody cares about or likes Luke in this entire story. Percy has met him twice. Annabeth and Grover don't have the backstory of them being like a family and arriving at camp together because that whole subplot with them and Thalia has been cut completely. And also, Annabeth doesn't have a crush on him here either. So he's just a random kid, but for some reason he hates the gods. Like, we know he hates his dad, but so does Percy in this movie, and he isn't interested in destroying the world over it. Percy, why do you want a war of the gods? Luke. Control. They've been in power for too many years. It's time for our generation to take over. Centuries ago, the Olympians defeated their parents and took control. Why shouldn't we do the same? Annabeth. Because you'll destroy all of mankind in the process. <laughs> exactly. Giving the young gods an opportunity to start over to create a new world of heroes. Percy, you're no hero. With a quick snap of his wrist, Luke triggers the bolt. A blast of lightning shoots out and blows up a massive hole in the building behind Percy Jesus. I feel like it should not be this easy for a random person just to just use Zeus's bolt. Eventually, Percy just tells Annabeth and Sally to go and tell Zeus everything. I do think it's hilarious that Sally is a part of this. They're blasting lightning at each other. They're blowing up water. Also, for parts of this, 
they're both wearing the winged shoes, so they're just flying around New York City. Luke wearing winged shoes, chasing Percy around through New York City, going back to the Sam Raimi Spider-Man parallels, is very Green Goblin. A high-speed chase between Percy and Luke flying through the cavernous streets of Manhattan. Like, does that sound like a Percy Jackson book? Be honest. That's a superhero movie scene. So they arrive at the Hudson River. Percy extends his hand towards the river. He tightens his brow, using every bit of strength, every muscle in his body. Percy closes his eyes, concentrates intensely. Luke lands on the dock, directly in front of Percy. Luke raises his sword to finish off Percy. It's over. I've won. The river begins to rumble, churn, waves form. Luke turns, sees an enormous wave heading straight for him. Luke starts to run, attempts to fly away. The wave completely engulfs Percy, Luke, and the dock. The water appears to reach out and grab Luke out of the air. The wave pulls him down under the water. Underwater night. The wave forms a whirlpool around Luke. He's being dragged beneath the water, screaming. Within moments, Luke screams, fade, he's gone. So Percy just killed him, I guess. Yeah, this is the kind of ambiguous ending that you would expect for a movie that wants to leave the door open for a sequel, but also wants to function as its own complete story. I, full disclosure, never saw Sea of Monsters, so I don't know how they brought him back. So they rush to floor 600 of the Empire State Building, which is where Olympus is located. Apparently then Chiron is just there. Interior, Zeus's palace, throne room, later night. All of the Olympians are seated and present. Zeus, Hera, Poseidon, Apollo, Artemis, Hestia, Hephaestus, Ares, Hermes, Demeter, Aphrodite, and Athena. The fact that Hestia is here opens up a can of worms I can't even get into in this video. This is very, this is very strange. <laughs> this is so weird. I feel like whoever wrote that just googled the 12 Olympian gods and like, this is like she was on the list and Dionysus wasn't so he just like added her in the first throne is Zeus he resembles a strong Roman emperor a sculpted grim face his eyes rainy gray with a well-trimmed beard next to him is Poseidon he resembles a handsome surfer his skin is deeply tanned hand scarred like an old fisherman's his striking blue eyes are identical to Percy's a faded tattoo of a trident is on his muscular forearm the gods are in the middle of an intense heated argument. Zeus and Poseidon are the most angry, looking as if they're about to get into a fist fight. Lord Zeus, wait, Chiron says off screen. Chiron runs into the throne room along with Percy, Annabeth, and Sally. We realize that the throne room and the gods are gigantic. The gods are each nearly 30 feet tall, dwarfing Chiron and the humans. Annabeth? Hey, mom. Percy steps forward, holding the master lightning vault. Hi, I'm- my name's Percy Jackson, and I- I think you guys might be looking for this. Zeus looks at Poseidon, who can't help but smile a little. Zeus glares at Percy. The lightning thief. I knew it. Bring it to me. Percy walks forward, places the bolt into Zeus's gigantic palm. When it's placed into Zeus's hand, the bolt grows back to its normal size. Congratulations, you've managed to save what's left of your father's reputation. Percy turns, exchanges his first look with Poseidon. Percy's eyes remain cold, hard. He turns back to Zeus. I didn't steal the lightning bolt. If my father had asked me to do something for him, I would have said no. I have no loyalty to him, I owe him nothing. I believe you owe your personality to him, but if you didn't take the bolt, why do you have it? It was stolen by Luke, son of Hermes. Hermes, I have a son named Luke? Oh my god, Hermes is even worse in this version. Why should I believe you? Percy, you don't have to. All you have to do is honor your word. I have returned the bolt by the summer solstice. Technically, you haven't. Now call off the war. For the sake of peace in our family, there will be no war. You have done me a great service. If there's anything I can do for you, feel free to ask. There's a satyr, my protector, named Grover. He's being held prisoner by Hades. Could you set him free? Annabeth steps forward, tentatively at first. I have an announcement. All of the gods turn to her. Annabeth takes Percy's hand. The son of Poseidon and the daughter of Athena are officially in love, Percy says. This is the part that got posted onto Twitter that made me want to read the entire screenplay. They exchange a kiss much to the shock of Athena and Poseidon. I think it's time you two stopped hating on each other. Poseidon and Athena sigh, holding back their anger, putting aside their feelings. For now, Zeus finds it all amusing, laughing. Our meeting is adjourned. I still don't trust you. Zeus vanishes in a blinding flash of light. Athena vanishes. All of the gods begin to vanish one by one except Poseidon. He looks down, catches Sally's eyes for the first time. He steps off the throne, walks forward. With each step, he becomes smaller, soon becoming the size of a mortal. I think that's a cute detail. Poseidon walks to Sally, gives her a tender kiss. Good to see you, Sally. You look beautiful. He 
You too. Of course you have that eternal youth thing going on. They exchange a warm smile. Poseidon turns, approaches Percy. They look at each other. An estranged father and son meeting for the first time. It's tense, uncomfortable. I mean, it's not a typical scenario. Poseidon, I can't thank you enough, Percy. Few heroes in history have accomplished what you've done. I'm proud of you, son. He extends his hand. Percy ignores it coldly. There's a long silence, years of tension between them. Sally nods to Annabeth and Chiron, looks back to Percy. We'll leave you two alone. Sally, Annabeth, and Chiron move several feet away. <laughs> we'll leave you two alone. Walks away five feet. Poseidon, I'm not asking you to like me. No need. I didn't do it for you. I did it to save mom. I know that. How old was I when you left? Poseidon, seven months. I'm surprised he's stuck around that long. Do you remember any of it? Every moment. You were a beautiful boy. Your mother and I were in love. I could have stayed forever. <laughs> Maybe you don't say that. Uh, why didn't you? Percy asks. I had other responsibilities. More important than us? I didn't care if you were there all the time, but I would have liked to see you even for a day, an hour. Why didn't you ever come back? I wanted to. I just, when I was with you and your mother, I became less concerned about my responsibilities. I was ignoring my natural destiny. I was becoming human. And that's bad. For a god? For the future of the universe? Yes, Percy, that's bad. What about these last two weeks? I almost died out there, but you didn't do anything. You didn't help me. Oh, and now Poseidon's gonna be like, I was a voice in your head giving you unsolicited, unhelpful advice about things that you already knew. Although he did send the horses to save them in that weird scene. <laughs> I was looking out for you every step of the way. When you needed me, I was there. Who do you think sent you horses in the desert? Who spoke to you to give you clarity in Lotus Land? But at least in the movie, I remember Poseidon being like, don't eat the flowers when Percy is about to eat another flower. Like, yeah, they've already wasted quite a lot of time at that point, but it was something that Percy wouldn't have realized had Poseidon not said that. In this screenplay, he told him to wake up after he already noticed that something was weird. When you sit in the bottom of the pool trying to figure out your life, the voice in your head is me. You did that to a kid who didn't realize he was a demigod? He's just gonna think he's schizophrenic. What, what does the voice say? I don't even remember. I don't even think they said what the voice said. I know this isn't the father-son relationship you've always wanted, but it's the best I can do. I hope someday you'll see that. So they kind of come to an understanding and the groundwork is laid for them to have some kind of relationship in the future. Okay, let's wrap up the screenplay and put it to bed. Interior, Ugliano home, a few days later, day. Gabe sits alone, in front of the TV, watching the news, drinking a beer. News anchor. Authorities have now confirmed that Percy Jackson and his mother have been safely returned after their month-long ordeal. Police now know that the two have been kidnapped by this man. A picture of Ares taken from a security camera at the All-American Diner appears on screen. The FBI has confirmed that he is also the man responsible for vandalizing the Parthenon in Nashville and the beheading of at least one other victim. I feel like uh, this is still going to be a life-changing event for Percy and Sally, even though they've been cleared of wrongdoing. The fact that they are like the only witnesses in the manhunt for this murderer is going to affect them. Exterior, Ugliano home, backyard day. Percy and his mom are reclining in beach chairs, sipping cool drinks. Annabeth sits in Percy's lap, arms around each other. In the background, Grover stands at the grill, flipping burgers. He, he is apparently not vegetarian. Persephone stands behind Grover, hands tucked into his back pocket. She nibbles lustfully on his earlobes. Percy looks at his mother. I want to show you something. A pause. Promise you won't be mad? Sally. Oh no, now what? Percy lifts up his shirt sleeve, revealing a tattoo of a trident on his right deltoid. It's an exact copy of his father Poseidon's tattoo. Sally touches it, her face flooding with fond memories. I love it. Is it permanent? Percy pauses, shrugs. Nothing's permanent, Mom. Annabeth raises an eyebrow to him. Percy smiles. Well, maybe one thing. Didn't really answer the question. <laughs> there is a loud crack of thunder. The clouds get darker. Grover, cooking the burgers, looks up into the sky. Maybe we should move this party inside. The sky erupts with thunder, followed by several intense, bright blasts of lightning. Percy watches the lightning show reflected in his eyes. Then it begins to rain. The drops fall slowly at first, soon becoming a downpour. The cool rain showers over the couple. A smile covers Percy's face along with something else we've never seen. An expression of peace and contentment. From off screen we hear, Gabe off screen. Sally, beer. Get it yourself, you lazy bum. Percy looks back, exchanges a smile with Sally. Gabe storms into the kitchen, muttering, get it myself. You're getting to be as lazy as that loser son of yours. Well, I've got news for both of you. Gabe reaches for the refrigerator door. I'm the king of the castle and there are gonna be some changes made around here. Gabe opens the refrigerator and looks in horror. He sees 
The head of Medusa, eyes wide open, staring back at Gabe. There's a loud lightning crack. The screen goes white. The end. That's the whole thing. We read it. 119 pages. Okay. I guess... I guess we've stalled long enough. It's time to unpack this. So this first email is from Rick from 2009, January of 2009. And in it, he doesn't react to the script because he hasn't been sent it yet, but instead to the decision that was made by filmmakers to raise Percy and Annabeth's age from 12 to 17. I understand that a decision has been made to age the main characters in the film to 17. As no one wants to see this film succeed more than I do, I hope you'll let me share a couple of reasons why this is a bad idea from a money-making point of view. Rick understands his audience and the language they speak, and that language is money. First, it kills any possibility of a movie franchise. I don't know if you or your staff have had the chance to read farther than The Lightning Thief in the Percy Jackson series, but there are four other volumes. The series is grounded on the premise that Percy must progress from age 12 to age 16, when, according to a prophecy, he must make a decision that saves or destroys the world. I assume that X would at least like to keep open the option of sequels, assuming the first movie does well. Starting Percy at 17 makes this undoable. I'm also sure that X, for the first Harry Potter movie, some in the studio argued making the characters older to appeal to a teen audience. Fortunately, they took the long view and stayed true to the source material, which allowed them to grow a lucrative franchise. This would have been impossible if they started Harry at 17. The same principle applies here. I'm really worried that this is just not the way that studios work. In the age of the MCU, it feels like everything is trying to be a franchise or spawn a wider universe. But back in 2009, I think they just saw every movie as a one and done. Like, they won't waste energy thinking about the next movie when they make it. If they do get another movie, they'll cross that bridge then. Plus, unless it's a certain studio like Disney making a franchise like the MCU, they don't typically task filmmakers with planning out an entire series of films, so the writer and director are concerned with making one movie. If there's a sequel, it's not even a guarantee that they'll be the ones writing and directing it, so why should they care? But the studio is asking them to put in hints to later films as long as they aren't too obvious because they may not get a sequel at all. And then we're in this painful middle ground where no one is committing fully to either making a standalone film or the first film in a greater series. My thought is that I would rather have an unabridged first film in a series that's just well-made and fun, even if it ends on a cliffhanger that doesn't end up getting addressed because the future films aren't made. Like, maybe it will suck that the franchise will forever be unfinished, but even then, at least you got one good film out of it, plus you'll always have the books. And as far as serialized book series go, the Lightning Thief is a pretty self-contained story. The only element that is not addressed by the end is Luke and Kronos, but it's not necessarily a cliffhanger given how the story ends. It has a sense of finality to how it's written. There's no reason they couldn't have just made that movie. Second, it alienates the core audience. I'm guessing those book sale numbers are important to X because you're hoping all those kids show up to the theater. The core readership for Percy Jackson is age 9 to 12. There are roughly a million kids that age, plus their family, who are dying to see this film because they want to see the pictures in their imagination brought to life. Many of these kids have read the books multiple times and know every detail. They are keenly aware that Percy is 12 in the first book. By making the characters 17, you've lost those kids as soon as they see the first movie trailer. You signal that this is a teen film, when the core audience is families. I understand that you want to appeal to teens because they are a powerful demographic, and conventional wisdom says that teens will not see movies about kids younger than themselves. Harry Potter proved this wrong, but aside from that, deviating so significantly from the source material risks pleasing no one. Teens, who know the books are meant for younger kids, and the younger kids, who will be angry and disappointed that the books they love have been distorted into a teen movie. I haven't even seen the script yet, so I don't know how much the story has changed, but I feel the movie will be dead on arrival with a 17-year-old lead. I think it's overwhelmingly clear that movie studios do not see middle graders as an audience. They think about teens who are old enough to buy tickets and go to the movies themselves, and they think about little kids whose parents bring them to the movies. But the core audience for these books is really an age range that only exists in publishing. It's like the conventional wisdom that Rick is talking about here. This is an age range that you can't market to and make a profit, according to them. This is just so sad because not only are these the kids most passionate about the movies, but older kids and even adult fans would also be disappointed if the source material was so drastically changed, even if it turned out to be a better than average teen movie. I've spent the last four years touring the country, talking about the movie. I've seen hundreds of thousands of kids. They are all excited about the movie, but they are also anxious. 
Most of these kids have no idea which studio produces the film, but everywhere I go, they say the same thing. Please don't let them do to the lightning thief what they did to X. Don't let them change the story. These kids are the seed audience for the movies. They are the ones who will show up first with their families, then tell their friends to go or not go depending on how they liked it. They are looking for one thing. How faithful was the movie to the book? Make Percy 17 and that battle is lost before filming even begins. By the way, lots of people think that the unnamed movie Rick referenced here was Aragon. Thanks for letting me say my piece. I care too much about this project to see it fail. So Rick wrote this whole email and sent it in January. According to the date, the script that we read was already completed by this point and had time to get a Chris Columbus rewrite. So Rick wrote and sent that email in January of 2009. The screenplay that we read, according to the date on the cover, was completed in September of 2008 and had time to get a Chris Columbus rewrite. It's possible Rick just got his dates wrong, but it's unlikely if he found the actual emails. I would sooner believe that the studios just left Rick very much out of the loop when it came to working on the screenplays, which is their right to do under the contracts they had, I'm sure, but it's also not a smart move if you wanted his input on the films, which I assume they did, or else they would never loop him in on these emails to begin with. So in March of 2009, Rick sent an email regarding the screenplay that he was sent sometime between the previous email and this one. This is that email. Hi. Thank you for letting me look at the script. It's very important for me that the movie does well. I also take my role seriously as an advocate for fans of the book, who have been pleading with me for four years, please don't let them change the story. In my view, the two go together. When I look at children's books that have been made into movies over the past few years, I see a direct correlation between how faithful an adaptation is and how well it does at the box office. I'm not sure the movie industry sees this connection as they keep making the same mistakes over and over again, but it's pretty clear to me and to the young readers I talk to every day. There are things I like about this adaptation. Well, you know someone positively hates whatever you've turned in when they start with an ominous paragraph about how much they care about the project and then get all of the things that they like about it out of the way immediately. The beginning works well. The opening scenes do a good job getting into the story quickly and setting up the characters. The first part of the story has been made more economical, but it is still more or less faithful to the spirit of the book. You can tell that even though Rick is clearly prioritizing faithfulness to the books, he also understands that staying true to the spirit of the source material is most critical, not necessarily all of the little details, which is basically what I said in my video on the Disney Plus show. The scene with the Minotaur is nicely crafted. I like the Minotaur appearing out of the field of cows. The gates with the words rearrange themselves as Camp Half-Blood was a nice touch. The gates with the words that rearrange themselves as Camp Half-Blood was a nice touch. Annabeth's first appearance was good. I like how she's been made a more physically challenging rival for Percy. The scene in Las Vegas is mostly good. I have a few suggestions on that, but they are easy changes. I like the entrance to the underworld being at the Hollywood sign. The way Gabe is petrified at the end makes sense, and the idea of heroes toting X's head across the country makes me chuckle. The fact that instead of Medusa's head it says XXX makes me think that there was originally an actor's name here or something because why else would he censor it? So like, did they have an actor in mind for Medusa? Having said that, here's the bad news. The script as a whole is terrible. I don't simply mean it deviates from the book, though certainly it does that to the point of being almost unrecognizable as the same story. Fans of the book will be angry and disappointed. They will leave the theater in droves and generate horrible word of mouth. That is an absolute given if the script goes forward as it stands now. But the bigger problem is that even if you pretend the book doesn't exist, this script doesn't work as a story in its own right. He cooked. He's right. I've seen some people say that if you take the first movie on its own and pretend the book doesn't exist, that it's not that bad. And I've heard this mostly from people who don't seem to have read the books. And like, I'm sure the movie doesn't seem as bad without the books to compare it to. But guys, guys, this movie is terrible. It's so cringy, it's hard to get through. There are almost no moments where it's funny on purpose. None of the characters are even likable, let alone instantly iconic. It's just the worst of YA cliches and tropes from this particular era. The good news. It is eminently fixable. When I first read the script, I'll admit I was plunged into despair at just how bad it was. If I were intentionally trying to sabotage this project, I doubt I could have done a better job than this script. Woof. But as I began to make notes and look specifically at what was bothering me, I realized that the script could be made palatable to fans and the general movie-going audience without really changing its present scene structure, lengthening the script, or adding new sets that would increase the budget. I am choosing to take heart in your assurance that this script is not finished. That is one thing we can agree on. It needs help. So if you're still with me, here are my specific thoughts and suggestions for a fix. 
my concerns fall into three basic categories, age appropriateness, structure, and the writing. I'll address these in general first, then follow with specific suggestions and page-by-page -page notes. This is the easiest fix, but an important one. The Percy books are family-oriented. They are read primarily by children aged 9 to 12. You will have, I hope, a large number of parents bringing their 9 to 12 year old children to this movie, expecting to see something appropriate for that age range. As one of those parents, I would walk my kids right out of the cinema if this movie included some of the language and content presently in the script. It's so painful to imagine Rick having to read these scenes. Like, it put me through physical pain. I can't imagine what it would do to this old man. Like, this poor man is a father. He is a teacher. He should not have to deal with this. I don't mind being a little subversive and pushing boundaries, but there is nothing radical, fresh, or interesting about biatch, ass, or shit. It's a lazy attempt to make the script seem hip to teens, but such language has been overused to the point that it doesn't even rate a cheap laugh anymore. If you go this route, you will lose the entire demographic of families with younger children. School groups who otherwise would take field trips to see this movie will stay away en masse. Neither do I believe you have to have cliché, crude language, and gutter humor to engage a teen audience if you have a script that is funny, fresh, and original. As it is, the script will offend parents of younger children and alienate what should be its core audience while gaining nothing. I will say, I don't know what Rick is talking about when he says that school groups are going to go on field trips to the movies. Like, I'll defer to him because he is a teacher, he would know, but I, I have never heard of a school just taking a field trip to go to the movies. I'm talking with 4th and 5th graders all the time about this upcoming movie. I would be horrified if I steered them into a movie with this kind of content. I wouldn't see it, I wouldn't let my kids see it, I wouldn't recommend anyone else see it, and I certainly wouldn't want my name associated with it. Please do not sex up my children's story. If you take out all the lines I've flagged and put in something funnier and fresher but not blatantly crude, you will have a stronger script with wider appeal. This poor man, he is on his knees, he is begging here. This is a really good point though, because it's not just a matter of an author trying to control an adaptation of their work anymore, he actually stands to be materially hurt by an adaptation that casts him and his works in a bad light. For a movie based on a book to be bad is one thing. Most readers and viewers would charitably just assume that the book was better. But for it to be inappropriate or offensive would almost be slanderous to the original especially if the author was promoting the film to his young audience without knowing its content. I have no problem with changes for the sake of streamlining. I also understand the need to limit the number of sets to stay within budget. The script does this well in many places. You've cut the Oracle at Delphi, Dionysus, the search for Pan, Clarice, I could go on and on, but those changes don't upset me because they don't affect the story's core. I'm not so understanding of adding scenes and plot lines that are completely foreign to the book and make the story read like an illogical hatchet job. Cook Rick. His arguments are so fair, and honestly, that's what makes the brutal parts hit harder. The most prominent examples. Persephone's Pearls. A truly bad plot device. In the original, Percy must go across country because he cannot fly, as Zeus would zap him out of the sky. He's got a timer, the summer solstice. He's got double motivation. Find his mother, and find Hades, who supposedly has the lightning bolt. He's got a goal, Los Angeles. That gives them plenty of reason to go to the Underworld without tagging on some superficial quest for pearls that don't have any basis in Greek mythology. This is the point where the script takes a hard left turn into the weird. The story ceases to be the lightning thief, and it will have fans squirming in their seats and demanding a refund. Nashville, the Hydra, Battle Bugs. This entire scene is awful and completely alien to the story. I'm guessing it was added because the set is easier to make than, say, the St. Louis Arch, or you're thinking the Hydra is more recognizable than the Chimera. Again, this is a place where you will lose the readers of the books in droves for no good reason. I think it could easily be fixed. It could also be a place to insert Ares, as you've mentioned you're interested in that. I've given my ideas for this below in the page-by-page -page critique. I've said before I don't think the version of the script that Rick read is the version that we have because, as you can see here, he apparently read one without Ares in it, and then there's also some reference to battle bugs, which is not explained any further. Luke. In the original, Luke is a rival for Annabeth's affections. He's older, good-looking, cool, and suave with an important backstory. In the script, Luke has become a sniveling little slime ball. This A takes away a great source of romantic tension, B makes it much too obvious that Luke is the villain, C destroys the series' storyline in which Luke becomes Percy's arch-enemy and eventually morphs into Kronos, and D makes the script ending anticlimactic. I don't think it's a bad idea to have a fight with Luke at the end, though I still think it's not nearly as exciting as a fight with Ares, but if you have a fight with Luke, he should be an attractive, powerful enemy. Who wants to see our hero fight a little creep? Why is that exciting? 
I didn't necessarily get creep from Luke in this story, but I could see that, especially thinking about the film where I do feel like Luke was cast and styled so strangely. In the screenplay we read, he just felt boring, like there was so little to him. Persephone. Talk about a deus ex machina. She had no part in the original and has been added to patch up a storyline that no longer makes sense. The ending now, with Grover getting out of the underworld off stage, has no tension and no believability. I would strongly encourage you to restore the mystery of the original plot. Percy believes Hades has the lightning bolt, and he discovers along the way that this cannot be true, which leads them to the realization that they've all been played by Ares. Again, I've put my specific suggestions below. Kronos. This is rather important if you want to preserve the possibility of a franchise, as Kronos is the master villain in the series. Having said that, I can see making a script that works with only a passing mention of Kronos, but at the very least, it should be Ares manipulating Luke, and there should be some question at the end of the book. Why would Ares do this? Was he working alone? This would at least have some opening to introduce Kronos later. I wonder if there is absolutely no mention of Kronos in the script that he read. I know the finished film added the story of the gods overthrowing Kronos to the museum scene at the start of the film, which makes a lot more sense than Grover delivering this exposition literally as Kronos was about to eat them. The fight with Ares. Honestly, this is the best, most cinematic scene in the book. It's a crime to exclude it from the movie, and Ares is the best adult role in the story. So this is what I don't get. It's the one thing still tripping me up. Ares was in this version of a screenplay. Then he was taken out for the version that was sent to Rick, but they told him they were still interested in introducing Ares, and then they clearly decided not to, seeing how he wasn't in the movie. So either Rick got his dates wrong, and actually the version of the script that he read was from before the September 2008 version, or they did just send him a later version of the script without telling him about its predecessors, even though it had been months at that point. Or the date on the cover of the screenplay is wrong. You've mentioned that the script is still being revised for logic and motivation, and I can understand why. The plot has been chopped up so thoroughly that it no longer holds together. As I said, I think this could be fixed without radically changing the scene structure that you've developed, but it would take better writing by someone who understands the story, which brings me to the last point. The writing. The dialogue needs to sparkle. I'd like to see it be fresh and original and funny. Right now, there are some good areas, but mostly it is flat, tired, and uninspired. It's certainly not funny. I'm not expecting lines to be lifted from the book verbatim, but it would be nice if they resembled the source material, at least in tone and spirit. One of the things that defines Percy is his sense of humor. He doesn't have one in the script. When X first acquired the book, I was told one of the main selling points was the humor. Why then do we want to settle for a script that is completely devoid of the story's trademark humor? Yeah, honestly, I don't think it's unreasonable to say that lines should be lifted verbatim from the book if you're looking to capture the book's distinct and unique brand of humor. You have those lines and dialogues for you to use, that's what you bought the rights for, no need to reinvent the wheel. There is no heart or soul to the story. The only motivator seems to be sex. Will Annabeth and Percy get together? That's A, not enough, and B, not done very well. Well, yeah, it sounds really bad when you put it like that. Percy. Percy should doubt himself. He's conflicted about his father. He shows resentment towards the gods and his dad, but finally has reconciliation and realizes that he is different than Luke. He can rise above his anger and become a hero, except his parents even if they are not perfect. There needs to be a message here about what it takes to become a hero. There is only the tiniest hint of this in the script, and it's not nearly powerful enough. On the romantic front, Percy is attracted to Annabeth, but she also intimidates and annoys him at times. He's not completely driven by hormones to get the girl as he is in the script. Their relationship needs to be more nuanced. It's true, Percy really didn't have any kind of journey in this screenplay. He came to accept his father, but only because his dad gave a very straightforward explanation of why he wasn't there during his childhood, which seemed to have alleviated all of Percy's concerns. And of course he got with Annabeth over the course of the story, but he basically only had one real feeling towards her, and it was attraction. I did think the pool scene was cute, but it also didn't fit in this movie where the kids are supposed to be getting to know each other for the first time. If you want to see Percy and Annabeth get dunked underwater and kiss, that's what the ending of The Last Olympian is for. Annabeth. She is meant to have a backstory with Luke. She's conflicted about her feelings towards Percy because of this. Their romance in the script is too obvious, too quick, and not nearly interesting enough. Where is the tension, the doubt, the conflict? And in terms of the series arc, getting them together in the first installment throws out four more books worth of character development. It would be much better if they kiss at the end, but it is still very unclear whether they are actually together. It should be more of a tease. For real though, who is Luke in this? He's literally just another guy at camp. It's interesting and notable that Rick seems to understand that Hollywood movies work differently from book series and that they are constantly trying to address things that would otherwise be addressed in future installments because they don't know that they're going to get a sequel. 
So yeah, they might need to kiss in this version because that's how action movies work. The male action hero lead gets the girl. But even from that perspective, it's weird that they decided to have them get together immediately, like at the start of the second act practically. I also find it funny that this might be the one area where they took his advice because the film ends with Annabeth and Percy training at camp and almost kissing but then it's a fake out and they keep sword fighting. There was probably more than just Rick recommending that change, but at the very least, pacing wise, it was the correct decision. Grover. Grover has become a cipher in the script. All he cares about is sex. There is a passing reference to his need to earn his stripes, but it never feels real, and Grover never seems worried about it. If you take out the entire subplot about Pan, okay, but Grover needs to have something more serious on the line. For instance, his reputation and his backstory having failed once before as Luke and Annabeth's protector. Percy's quest is his shot at redemption. This would only take a few lines to develop, but it would make the character more than simply comic relief. Truly. Because yeah, you can save the Pan subplot until the second movie if you don't know the plot of the Sea of Monsters, it's integral to it. But you can't cut his backstory with Annabeth and Luke, it ruins all of the characters involved. Okay, this next paragraph is the last one in his emails and it's, to me, shocking on another level. If you find my comments of merit, I'd be happy to revise the script myself, which you could then take or leave as you please. I could do this without changing the number of scenes or the length of the script, and if necessary, I will set everything aside to turn this around quickly. My main focus would be freshening up the dialogue, adding Percy Brand humor, and trying to tighten up the logic of the plot while keeping it simple. Note that my rough suggestions for substitute lines below are just that. Rough. I would take care to make the wording punchier and more economical. At the very least, please address my concerns and get another writer who has actually read the book and can make the necessary changes, but at this point, I really don't trust anyone but myself to do it correctly. If the script goes forward in its present form, I don't need to be the Oracle of Delphi to foresee what will happen. You will lose fans of the series 100%, but more importantly, the script will fail to impress even regular moviegoers who haven't read the book. The movie will become another statistic in a long line of failed movies badly adapted from children's books. No one wants that, and a year from now, I would really prefer not to be saying, I told you so. I don't know how you as a filmmaker or a studio turn down a passionate author with intimate knowledge of the source material offering to do free work for you. I don't know if there were legal issues with asking him to write his own treatment or punch up the script, given that he wasn't going to be a credited writer on the film and they probably didn't want him to be. But Rick has always been very fair and very open about the adaptation process, for example acknowledging that it's abnormal for an author to have any kind of control or even substantial influence when it comes to an adaptation of their books. If there were a contractual or union issue, I'm sure he would have mentioned it. Rick has gone on to describe his relationship to the movies and other blog posts, but because of how his website has changed over the years, it's hard to find the originals. I do specifically remember him saying that if he hates an adaptation, you will easily be able to tell from how he never brings it up, never promotes it, doesn't speak highly about it, etc. Whereas if he's proud of it, he'll talk about it all the time. I also found this one article which references a 2016 blog post that I had never seen and has since been deleted, but apparently he begged teachers to not show the movies in classrooms and even said, I would rather have my own teeth pulled with no anesthesia than watch these movies. Rick isn't on social media anymore. His accounts are run by other people, and when they do tweet or post on Instagram, replies are typically turned off. But suffice it to say that Rick did not want so much as an easter egg referencing the movies in his TV show. And we know this because he said so. In this current era of callbacks and references and greater cinematic universe, of course the younger fans wanted Lady Gaga's poker face to play in the show's casino scene. It would be a nice hint that even though the movies weren't great, they exist, they're part of the larger PJO canon, and now that there's a new adaptation out, there's no hard feelings over it. But no. Rick is here to tell you kids that there are hard feelings over these god's damn movies and he is not letting go of those feelings anytime soon. Some fans might think that that makes him a bitter old man or an egotist or a control freak, but I hope that reading the screenplay and Rick's genuine attempts to do everything in his power to avert this train before it crashed will help you understand where he's coming from. He, the person closest to the situation who lost the most from these movies flopping so hard, would prefer we all just pretend that the movies don't exist. Ma, 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 ma. Ma, 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 ma. I wanna hold them like they do in Texas, baby. Fold them, let them hit me, raise it, baby, stay with me, I love it. Look the new wish and play the games until the star. And after he's been hooked to play the
the one that done his heart. Oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, oh, 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 I get high. Oh Personally, I connect with Rick begging teachers not to show the PJO movies in classrooms because in sixth grade, during the absolute peak of my Percy Jackson obsession, we read The Lightning Thief in reading class, and at the end, our teacher said that he would show us the movie. I literally confronted him with my friends who were also fans and made myself cry to convince him not to show it. And he did anyway, but I got permission to not be in class that day because it was so psychologically traumatizing for me. Body.